Father, we ask now that as we ponder these words of Scripture and that your Holy Spirit would apply the very truths that Paul wrote so forcefully to the church in Corinth, that your Holy Spirit would apply the, the point, the truth of these words to our hearts. And Lord, would you, would you have this result in us? Would you accomplish this effect in us? That we would believe that Jesus Christ has been raised from the dead and everything that follows from that. For we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated as we take up the offering. I want to encourage you, if you are a visitor with us, just we're glad you're here. Don't think twice about just letting that offering bag, I think it is, offering bag, just pass right by you. And uh, if you are a regular visitor or a regular guest here, or part of the church family, we're grateful for your generosity. There are ways you can give that besides just being in church, there are also on the slide there behind me, there is um, a number you can text on your phone to give by phone or a place on the web you can go to on your computer to give there as well. Well, this is uh, part two of a sermon series that began last Easter and is now continuing today. Uh, now, you may not remember that. Uh, I barely remembered that. In fact, I, as I, Easter was coming up, I thought, I should preach on the resurrection. I should preach on 1 Corinthians 15. I don't think I've preached on that for a long, long time. And then I looked back, and sure enough, last Easter I preached on 1 Corinthians 15. I had completely forgotten about it. Well, so last Easter I preached on the first 11 verses. Now I'll carry on from, the, from verse 12 and on and, and cover the next few paragraphs. The title of my sermon is this. Do you, believe in, do you believe death will die? I could also put it, do you believe in the death of death? And, and if you know that famous, famous work by John Owen, the death of death and the death of Christ, uh, I, I do have one, um, one eye towards that book as, as I titled this sermon. Do you believe death will die? Have you ever heard someone criticized for as they say, being so heavenly minded, they're of no earthly good. You've heard that? As I've often thought about that, maybe, maybe what's in mind when that criticism is, is uh, leveled, maybe what's in mind is, is that such people aren't being helpful. They're, they're being impractical. Maybe they're, they're just dreaming of, of heaven, what heaven will be like, and they're, 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 it's all pie in the sky for them. Instead of doing something real, something useful, like, like feeding the poor or building shelters for the homeless or, you know, doing something to help. And that's fair. That's fair. On the other hand, <laughs> what if, what if all of us were, were only earthly minded, <laughs> convinced being earthly minded, convinced that there is no heaven or hell, John Lennon's uh, imagination has come true, there's no heaven or hell, there's no good, there's no God. There's no life after death. There's nobody, to, there's nobody to pray to when your child is diagnosed with cancer. Nobody to hope in when hope in this world starts to fade. Nobody to lean on when everything you're leaning on begins to crumble. What would it be like to live with that mindset that has nothing better to look forward to than dying. What would you say to bad news that you receive? You know, when you get bad news, when you hear bad news, when someone comes and tells you some bad news, what would you say? Your dog died? Yeah, that was going to happen anyway, right? Would you say that? Not if you're nice, but I mean it's the truth. If you're just earthly minded and someone comes to you and and says your loved one has stage 4 cancer. Would you say, well, what else should I have expected? When you hear that there's a 
another war in the world. Or that there's a lovely, a lovely family couple and, and their two or three kids and they were on holiday and something awful happened and the whole family was killed in a car accident. Would you just say, say la vie, such is life. What if we were all just earthly minded? What if, what if nobody ever puts a stop to death? What if death never dies? What if death, death itself never dies? If you close your eyes, can you imagine what it would be like if the one thing that lived forever was death? And these verses in, in 1 Corinthians 15, it's a lot of material. There's a lot of verses here. We just read them. There's, there's a lot that Paul's saying, but it's not hard to follow the train of, of Paul's thought, of the thought of this writer, the apostle Paul, an apostle of Jesus named Paul. You can see in verse 1, if you just briefly scan back to what we read, he wants his readers to be strong enough to be able to stand in their faith, to endure in the faith that they had been they, they had received that they had received from him what they had believed was the gospel paul preached to them the good news literally that's the gospel the good news that paul had told them about and that news was what they came to believe that was the faith they had it was a belief in the gospel the good news that had been preached to them standing firm in that belief is what paul wants to help them do now so so to remind them, he reminds them, and he outlines the faith that they'd received for them. He outlines this in verses 1 to 11. And Paul says these things he himself had received that he passed on to them were of first importance. There's nothing more important than these, Paul says, than this gospel, these points of the faith. And he lays out four basic facts. And he presents them, I want you to notice, as fact. As historical fact, not spiritualistic truths that depend on whether there's faith in the heart of the recipient. No, he presents these as news of things that actually happened. Fact. Four things. In verse 3, Jesus Christ died. In verse 4, he was buried, then uh, raised on the third day. Fact number 3, in verses 6 to 8. Jesus appeared alive to many witnesses, last of all to Paul himself, which is why Paul is an apostle, an eyewitness of the resurrection of Jesus, commissioned to go out and preach the gospel. But then starting in verse 12, Paul directly confronts the earthly-minded people in the church, the skeptics in the church who insisted that there's no such thing as resurrection. Who then, therefore, those people accept in principle that death will never die. Well, that was Greece. <laughs> Corinth, the, the city where Paul wrote this letter to. It was in Greece. We're not like that, right? We don't have any doubters in the church. None of us have problems believing in such a thing as life from the dead. We just take it for granted, right? Uh, I want you to know that, that we shouldn't be surprised that there were doubters in the church in Corinth that Paul was writing this letter to. Doubt in Christian churches is as old as the hills. It's not a new phenomenon. It's always been there in Christian churches. There's always been people who had trouble believing this or that. And this was the city of Corinth in Greece, after all. You know, the, the famous city of philosophers, Athens, was just a, a little under 100 kilometers away. I'd be very surprised if there was anyone in this congregation that Paul is writing this to who had never heard of, of the ideas of the skeptics and the cynics and the stoics. I guess if you're going to be a philosopher, you've got to name your thing something that ends in ix. Uh, skeptics and cynics and stoics and the epicureans well they didn't fit in but when when paul when paul brought this gospel this good news about jesus to greece churches were planted 
many began to believe this good news. They were baptized. They became part of the church family in each local place where a church was springing up. As verse 1 puts it, they were standing in this faith they had received. But there were still some of them in that church that were still hanging on to some of those philosophical ideas that they'd received, that they'd been brought up with, that they'd heard from the philosophers. Ideas like that this material world is all that there is. And once you die, the stuff in your body just it, it dissolves and you're gone. That's it. It's over. A philosophy called materialism. Today, that's, isn't that a normal way to think today? Perfectly normal. Entirely based on a Greek philosophy. But perfectly normal. Even if the name, is, the name of Epicurus is strange to you, his ideas aren't. I'll bet that materialism and having materialistic assumptions, kind of defaulting to that, is very, very familiar to you. It's amazing how we can be almost unconscious of the things that we really do accept as true and don't question. So do you like me, and I need this so badly, but do you also, do you need a reminder that there's so much more to life than this, this dust and this dirt and this death? You need that reminder? That's exactly the reminder Paul gives the Corinthians in these verses. If the, if the materialistic assumptions about reality, about the way things really are, if they're real, if materialism is true, Easter makes no sense at all. Easter makes no sense. But on the other hand, if you accept Easter and its implications, by that I mean if you accept the resurrection, if you accept the Passover, if you accept the, the, the Pascal, the Pesach, if you accept what we're celebrating every Sunday when a Christian church gathers because it's the day on which the Lord was raised. If you accept that Jesus is alive, materialism makes no sense. So Paul reminds the, the Corinthians with three paragraphs, and he gives them three what-if scenarios. What if there's no such thing as a resurrection? What, what if there is? If it's true, how should that affect your hope, and, and how should it affect your life? So to help you perhaps become more self-aware of the materialistic assumptions that we all carry, that we're holding and we tend to hold alongside our belief that the gospel Paul preached is true. To kind of do some heart surgery or some, some assumed belief surgery and get at the heart of what's at stake, I've outlined my sermon like this. What if Jesus is dead? What if he's not? And lastly, what do you think you're doing? So first, what if Jesus is dead? For this, we look at verses 11 through 19. Uh, 12 through 19. Verse 12 through 19. If Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there's no resurrection of the dead? There's the what if. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I got that right. If Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there's no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. There's that first skeptical what-if scenario. Verse 12 puts it as a condition. You can see that the word if-then. There's that, that logical hypothetical. If-then. If Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead then how can some of you say there's no resurrection? Stop and think about that for just a second. If Paul preached that Jesus was raised on the third day, it was part of the facts of the gospel he said were of first importance. If you take that away, you take it all away. You can't be a Christian if you don't hold this as true. So when Paul says, if, if the gospel you believe holds that Jesus was raised, then how 
could you say things like, there's no resurrection, or water it down. Maybe just say things like, I don't really take the resurrection all that seriously. Ideas have consequences, right? If you believe it's impossible for the dead to be raised, what are you doing in church on Easter Sunday? <laughs> really? Consider the implications. Let's say you're right, and you shouldn't take the resurrection very seriously. Maybe, maybe, maybe someone here actually believes it's impossible for the dead to be raised. Let's say you're right. If there's no such thing as a dead person coming back to life, that's what resurrection is, then first, Paul points out in verse 13, Christ did not come back to life. And if that's true, Paul points out in verse 14, all the apostles' preaching, that is the entire New Testament, is empty, it's in vain. And then so is our entire Christian faith, our whole religion. It's in vain. And if that's true, then as he points out in verse 15, if that's true, the apostles can't be trusted at all. Since this would mean they're actually spreading lies about God if there's no resurrection. No such thing as a dead person coming back to life. Paul's saying you can't even look to the New Testament writers. You can't even look to these apostles. He says we. You can't even look to them as a guide for good morals or good ethics or anything. They're not trustworthy. If they're lying about God, they're liars and blasphemers. All in verse 15. Because if that's true, in, in verse 16, Jesus is dead. And if that's true, in verse 17, then your faith is useless and you're doomed. You're still in your sins. There's no forgiveness of sin. You've not been forgiven. And if that's true, and notice this one, verse 18, then all the other Christians who've already died are also just dead. They're simply gone. They've perished. They're not forgiven. They're not going to heaven. They're not going to come back to life. There's no life after death. They're dead. And if that's true, verse 19, that dead Christians died believing a lie, then if any of us still believe this, we're pathetic. Isn't that exactly what Paul said there? Verses 13 to 19 puts it rather bluntly. But to put it even more bluntly, let's count the bodies. <laughs> if there's no resurrection, based on what Paul's just told us, let's count the bodies, let's stack them up, see the casualties here. If there's no such thing as a dead person coming back to life, first, Jesus Christ is dead. Then, all his apostles are dead. They're just dead. Next, all of the suckers who believe the gospel they preach, they're also dead. All Christians are dead. If all Christians are dead, Christianity itself is dead. Even living Christians are as good as dead. We're just, you know, like that movie, Dead Men Walking. That's a lot of bodies. The casualties are enormous. If it's true that there's no such thing as the dead coming back to life. To paraphrase something Martin Lloyd-Jones said about nominal Christians, Christians who are just Christians in name, not really in belief and heart. If there's no such thing as the dead ever coming back to life, then the most useless, pathetic, deceitful thing in the world is a Christian church. But turn that around, if you will. Consider the reverse. If it is true that the dead come back to life, if there is a resurrection then the most useless, pathetic, deceitful thing in the world is a so-called Christian church that acts like the resurrection doesn't matter. And the person, the person who claims to be a Christian but lives as if the resurrection isn't really that big a deal is just as useless. Well then, Paul first made them think about what if Jesus is dead and next he makes them think about what if he's not? 
If we're going to play what-if games, well, let's ask this question. If we're going to be skeptical, let's be skeptical about our doubts. What if he's not dead? Take a closer look at verse 20. I'll read it in just a minute. Notice two things in verse 20. First, Paul does not say if in verse 20. Remember, he's an apostle commissioned by Jesus. He's an eyewitness who saw Jesus alive. He's not playing around with hypothetical maybes here. He says it's a fact, and he says it as a fact. Jesus is alive. Verse 20, the first part of the verse. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead. I love that. Just clarity. Not, I know some of you might be offended by this, but some of us believe this here, so I'm just going to come out and say it. We believe Jesus is alive. No, he doesn't say that. He says it's fact. No apologies. No holding back. This is just the way it is. There are two ways to go. You can either go with the way the world really is, or you can live in a dream world, an imaginary fairyland. And if you choose to believe Jesus is not alive, you're living in the imaginary fairyland, says Paul. Second, something utterly, in the, right in this verse, in the one sentence, something utterly amazing has begun. Right there in verse 20. First, Jesus is alive. Second, something amazing has begun. The second part of the verse 20, it says, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. In that one single verse, Paul tells you to look back on something that happened 2,000 years ago. And immediately, also, at the same time, look forward to a process that hasn't finished yet. Look at it again, verse 20. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. He's talking about those Christians he referred to earlier who are dead, who have died in their faith in Christ. The eyewitness, this eyewitness of Jesus' resurrection says, when Jesus was raised from the dead, it was like a harvest was begun that will eventually include the resurrection of all those who have fallen asleep in Christ. Back to verse 18. To Christians who have died. And now that is a thought that deserves the label breathtaking. Doesn't it? Think of it like this. Dominoes. Not the pizza. The tiles. Dominoes. If you line up a row of dominoes close enough together so that you push one over, what happens to them? They all fall down. You have to set them up right. But if you push down three dominoes, they all fall down. If you push down a million dominoes, they would all fall down as long as you had them set up right. That's what Paul's saying here with this metaphor of the first fruits of a harvest. Now that Jesus has been raised from the dead, the rest is just a matter of time. Verse 20. For every dead Christian, ever since Jesus was raised, everybody who died believing in Christ, being raised from the dead is now, it's not a matter of if, but when. The cause of their resurrection has already begun. And now we're just waiting for the effect. The cause and effect is not meant to be seen as something that's arbitrary or something that's optional or something you can believe if you really be, want to be that kind of spiritual Christian. Paul's saying it's connected to the fact he's already established Jesus came back to life. He was raised from the dead. So Paul's not saying that you can think it's likely that God will eventually decide to resurrect Christians as well. That's not what verse 20 is saying. Paul's not saying maybe the Lord will be gracious to us and raise us from the dead one day if he decides to, perhaps. No, by using the language of first fruits, that word, first fruits, Paul is saying the connection between Jesus' resurrection and the resurrection of every believer in the history of the world is organically connected. First fruits. There's a logic in Paul's thought. Whenever there is a true cause, there are also its effects. 
It does, it's just a matter of time. Some processes between cause and effect happen really fast. Some processes between cause and effect take a very long time. And unlike simple dom dominoes, it, it, just because you can't see what connects the cause and its effect doesn't mean that they're not connected. Verse 20, Jesus is alive. It's fact. He was raised from the dead. He is the first fruits of all those, all those who have fallen asleep in Christ. So think of it like harvesting a carrot from your garden. You can see the fronds when you, when you go to get a carrot. You can tell the row that's got the carrots in it versus the row that's got the, I don't know. I have no idea uh, where to go with this. The, the beans or something, like you, sure. Uh, you can see the carrot fronds, but you can't see the carrot, right? I mean, I think. It's, un it's under the dirt. You can tell I'm not a gardener. So if you wrap your, your, your fingers around the green fronds of a carrot and pull, what do you expect to get? Do you expect to get a handful of carrot fronds? Do you end up with merely carrot fronds, normally speaking? You get a carrot with it. Uh, now, of course, first fruits isn't quite as simplistic as I've made that sound right there, right? Uh, this is just an analogy. I'm making a point. The first fruits, the word there, it's about a harvest. And it's, it's about a huge harvest, a vast harvest. Not, not a few people here and there. We're talking gazillions. Revelation 7 says they can't be counted. It's a harvest, and now that Jesus has been raised, the harvest has begun. The carrot will follow. The first fruits has been pulled. The rest are attached. Since God has already raised Jesus, the rest will inevitably follow. Every single person united by faith to Jesus Christ, because they're united by faith to Jesus, they're in him, as verse 18 says. They're in him. So that when Jesus is raised up, it's just a matter of time till they're raised up with him. It's cause and effect. It's just that we're still waiting around for what God began with Jesus to be finished with us. This is what, what Paul makes abundantly clear in verses 20 to 23. The same sort of organic connection that ties the resurrection of believers to the resurrection of Jesus also explains why all human beings die. Because we're also organically connected to Adam. The first man. The Bible teaches that the first human being was Adam and that Adam sinned against God and the result of that sin is physical and spiritual death. The Bible gives the best evidence for why everything dies in the world. So since all human beings are descended from Adam, it's, it's not merely coincidence. It's not random when people die, when things die, when everything crumbles. It's cause and effect. Look at verses 20 and 22. Sorry, 21 and 22. For as by a man came death, by a man also has come the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam, in Adam. Who's in Adam? Everyone. As in Adam all die, so also in Christ Who's in Christ? Whoever believes in him. Whoever believes that gospel Paul already outlined in the first 11 verses. Those are the ones in Christ. All of them shall be made alive. Verse 22. This man who saw Christ alive, he's making a confident prediction. That just as surely as Jesus is alive, all in Christ will be made alive. Everyone who is organically connected to Jesus Christ. Whose spiritual life is now derived from the life that Jesus gives them. Every single person united to Jesus by faith. Whose destinies are now bound up in his destiny. 
he'll one day rise from the dead just like he did. Paul even tells us when this day of resurrection will happen. He tells us when. It's right there in verse 23. But each in his own order. Christ the first fruits, then at his coming, those who belong to Christ. That's when the day of the resurrection will happen. You thought I was going to name a date, didn't you? No, it happens at the return of Jesus Christ. The resurrection of the dead. When Jesus returns in power and glory. If you believe in him, you will rise. I was telling Maureen that I was thinking about Gordon as I studied this passage. When Jesus returns in power and glory, Gordon will rise. Amen. The day of Jesus' coming is also going to be the first day of the arrival of his kingdom. Because the row of dominoes we were talking about leading to the day Jesus comes again and to our resurrection didn't just begin on that first Easter. It actually goes back a lot farther than that. In fact, Adam just reminded us of this in his responsive reading as he was teaching us from Ephesians 1. In love... He predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will. What purpose? What will? Verse 4, even as he chose us in him before the foundations of the world. Ephesians 1 verse 4, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. In love he predestined us for adoption to the praise of his glorious grace. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses. When did God begin to plan this redemption? To the praise of his glorious grace, it was before the foundation of the world. Verse 4. Verse 10. As a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. Paul gets to this just a few verses later in 1 Corinthians 15 when he says that God may be all in all. God's had a plan. Ray preached it to us last week. The passage Ray preached last week, Psalm 2. The Son of God says, I will tell of the decree. The Lord said to me, sit at my right hand. Or today I have begotten you. The Lord said to me, sit at my right hand that I might make your enemies your footstool. I will tell of the decree. Rather, Psalm 2 verse 7 says, The Lord said to me, you are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. That decree was not, you know, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Today you've become my son. No, that decree was in eternity. Today I have begotten you. How long has Jesus, the Son of God, how long has the Son of God been the only begotten Son of God? Forever. In eternity, the Lord decreed, Ask of me, I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. Psalm 2, verse 8. God's decree that Jesus Christ would rule the world led to his vow to the serpent that the the descendant of the woman would crush the serpent's head. The decree in eternity that God said he would give all the nations of the earth as a kingdom to his son led to the day when Jesus Christ came alive in that tomb. And the decree in eternity that God said, ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage led to what hasn't happened yet. The resurrection of everyone who's united by faith to Jesus Christ. The decree that God said to his begotten son, his only begotten son, ask of me and I will make the nations your heritage, led to something else that hasn't happened yet. The arrival of the kingdom of Jesus Christ and the extension of that rule of Jesus Christ over the whole earth so that he rules everything. The row of dominoes. Verse 24 to 26 is what we see here. Then comes the end when he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power for he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. The row of dominoes Paul is talking about here contains the entire story of the Bible. 
from the first verse of Genesis to the last verse of Revelation, from before the first life was created on earth, from even before God said, let there be light, until all the way to the end, to the death of death. When Jesus returns to claim this world as, as his kingdom, Jesus will reign, Paul is showing us, until the Father puts all things under his feet, including death itself. And you can picture death, I think it's good to visualize it this way, you can picture death being mortally wounded. The moment Jesus came back to life on, in his tomb on that ancient Easter Sunday morning. But though wounded, death is not dead yet. It's not until Jesus frees this whole world from all sin and all rebellion, restoring the dominion that God once gave to Adam, that Adam forfeited the sin, that Adam lost, that finally Jesus will put death to death. Finally, the serpent's head will be forever crushed. And at last, the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ will be at peace. And then forever. John says in his vision, he wrote, I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. From his presence, earth and sky fled away and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which was the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books, according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Through the devil's lie. The world God gave Adam slipped from Adam's grasp. And in time, God the Father will bring everything into subjection under his beloved Son. And in the end, Jesus will give it all back to God. That God may be all in all. Verse 28. All these dominoes fall. They're predestined to fall. They're destined to fall. And they've already begun to fall. Because on the third day after Jesus was killed, God raised him from the dead. So Paul has asked, what if Jesus is dead? And he's shown that if the resurrection falls, the entire Christian religion, the entire faith falls with it. But since in fact Jesus was raised, all that God has promised rises with him. One of the worst movies of the 1990s is about a fictional town called Dante's Peak, built in the shadow of a dormant volcano. But wait, the volcano's not dormant after all. I just gave away the whole plot of the movie. The two main characters are a scientist whose fiance years before died because he hadn't taken the threat of a volcanic eruption, eruption seriously enough. That character is played by Pierce Brosden. And, and Linda Hamilton of Terminator fame plays the mayor of Dante's Peak, who also, of course, runs the coffee shop because it's full of tropes like that. And the problem is, as they, it falls to them, the, these two, the heartbroken scientists who failed terribly in the past and people died, and the mayor of the town who runs the coffee shop to save the town. It falls to them to rescue the town, to convince everybody this volcano is not dormant. It's really about to erupt and everybody's lives are in danger. The problem is most people just think they can go on living the way they always have. Just like everything's normal. In spite of the truth. Which leads me to my third paragraph here, to Paul's third paragraph. And the third question Paul asks, since Jesus is alive, what do you think you're doing? That's not exactly the way he puts it, but you'll see how he gets there. Beginning in verse 29. Let's go back to that dubious criticism that some people are so heavenly minded they're of no earthly good. Does that describe the Apostle Paul, do you think? No. It's the other way around, isn't it? He's so heavenly minded, he is of earthly good. 
I think people who use this as a criticism it might just mean something like that such Christians don't fit in well. They, they rock the boat. They're, they upset the apple cart with their zeal, with the religion they actually dare to believe, with all the things they do in Jesus' name. And they just won't be quiet and shut up and sit down and, and don't bother anybody with your religion and your gospel. They actually believe it's worth telling people about Jesus. They believe maybe like, like our brother David who loves to hand out tracts and show people the truth of the gospel. They actually dare to believe that. Those people are so annoying, aren't they? People who really believe Jesus is alive. Who are so much like the Apostle Paul. Well, they're of earthly good because they're heavenly minded. In the next two couple of verses, a few verses, Paul gives two examples of Christians whose behavior seems insane if there's no resurrection. And then he points to the behavior of some in the church that is absurd behavior since, in fact, Christ has been raised. Look with me at verses 29 to 34. Otherwise, says Paul, what do people mean by being baptized on behalf of the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why are people baptized on their behalf? Then turning to the apostles, he says, why are we in danger every hour? I protest, brothers, by my pride in you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die every day. What do I gain, Paul says the apostle, if humanly speaking I fought with wild beasts at Ephesus? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Do not be deceived. Bad company ruins good morals. Wake up from your drunken stupor, as is right, and do not go on sinning, for some have no knowledge of God. I say this to your shame. He's intending to shame these Christians, these nominal Christians, these people who live like the resurrection isn't that big a deal. He's intending to shame them, not just to make them feel bad, but that they would change. Do not go on sinning. Do not be deceived. Wake up. If there's no resurrection, it seems, back to verse 29, it seems like insanity that anyone gets baptized. Why? Baptism obviously is something Jesus commanded. Matthew 28, 19, for example, commands that everyone who becomes a follower of Jesus must be baptized. Christians get baptized. It's a sign, as Adam and Andrew have taught us in past responsive readings, it's a sign of our adoption into Christ, our cleansing from sin, and our commitment to belong to the Lord and to his church, to all the other believers. So baptism is an act that shows a believer is joining with the Lord and his church. You see? Baptism is, in this way, speaking in verse 29, on behalf of the Lord and his church. It means you are saying you now belong to Christ and his people when you're baptized. That's who you did it for. You're joining with, you're identifying with the Lord and his people. But what about, Paul might ask, what about those who think and live like there's no resurrection? What if they're right? And Paul says, wouldn't baptism be a totally bizarre thing to do in that case? To identify with people and the Lord who are dead? I mean, look back to verse 13. If there's no resurrection, Jesus is dead, right? Look at verse 17. If there's no resurrection, your faith is futile and you're still in your sins. Everyone in the church in Corinth that was alive reading, hearing this letter preached at the time. Look at verse 18. If there's no resurrection, those who have fallen asleep in Christ, Christians who've already died, have perished. This would make Christian baptism an act that's for the sake of a dead man named Jesus, that would make baptism an act that shows we're joining ourselves to a whole bunch of Christians who died before us, but who are going to stay dead forever, in verse 29, being baptized on behalf of the dead, it sounds like a bizarre thing to do. 
which is exactly what Christian baptism is if there's no such thing as the resurrection. It's a bizarre thing to do. In other words, knowing that baptism is just about the most basic thing, the most basic starting point of the living life as a Christian. It's where you begin living life as a Christian. If you don't know it's true that God raised Jesus from the dead, why are you trying to be a Christian? Why are you part of the church? Why have you made these people your people and all the dead Christians your people and the dead Lord your person? your Savior, your Lord. But then if those who don't take the resurrection seriously, if they're right, everything Paul and the other apostles were doing is also totally bizarre and insane. Verse 30 to 32. Why are we in danger every hour? I protest, brothers, by my pride in you, which I have in Christ Jesus our Lord, I die every day, not literally, but his, his life is on the line every day. He's choosing, I'm going to do this, I might die, it's worth it. Jesus is alive, he's making that decision, he's dying every day. What did I gain if, humanly speaking, I fought with beasts at Ephesus, metaphorically? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. There's the sum of the matter. It's as if Paul's asking, what are we apostles doing? His life's work was to plant churches like this one in Corinth. But he was always putting his life on the line. For what? If there's no resurrection of the dead. The dangers he faced, the suffering, the scars and the injuries, what was the point? He should have been living it up, right? Wouldn't that be more reasonable? Wouldn't that be a better use of his time just to get some pleasure out of his final days? If Jesus has not been raised from the dead, why risk your neck to tell anyone about him? That would be crazy. But you know what Paul found even more bizarre? Those people in the church in Corinth who let materialistic philosophies and, and people who don't know God influence how they live and how they think about what's real. Paul found that to be bizarre. Verse 33 and 34. Do not be deceived. Do not be deceived. Do not let anyone deceive you. Bad company ruins good morals. Who are you hanging around with? Where are you getting your thinking? Why are you letting those people affect how you think about what's real? Wake up from your drunken stupor as is right and do not go on sinning for some have no knowledge of God and they're the people teaching you? They're the people whose ideas you just accept? I say this to your shame. Now the third paragraph we just looked at is where Paul applies everything he's just said about the truth of the resurrection. I, I don't think, I, don't, I really don't think any of you would come out and just say that there's no such thing as the resurrection. I don't think any of you would just come out and be willing to say you don't believe the dead are raised, that you believe that's a lie. I think we're pretty accustomed. After 2,000 years of Christianity, to sort of compartmentalizing our religious beliefs on one category, we, we keep a very a titanium wall between you know, whatever, adamantium, the Marvel comics say, stronger than titanium. We keep a, an adamantium wall separating our religious beliefs from the rest of our life, just in case it might spill over. We compartmentalize. We make sure that the things that we learn about in church and we read in the Bible that we sort of believe spiritually are true don't have too much effect on how we live and what we imagine is real in the real world. But do not be deceived, says Paul. If the dead body of Jesus Christ nearly 2,000 years ago started breathing again, if his heart started beating again, if he opened his eyes and sat up and smiled and he walked out of that tomb then to live 
even just a little bit as if it's not true, when you know better, is just as bizarre, just as irrational as anything those skeptics were saying in Corinth. And we do it all the time. So what are you living for? Stuff? Dirt? Dust? <laughs> material things? Don't you know that when Jesus comes back again, you will be raised to never die again? Do you know that? Do you believe there's a real day coming in the real world, in this world, in real future, yet, yet history that hasn't happened yet? I don't know how to say that. Prehistory. Do you believe there's a day coming, a real day in this world, when even death will die? How about we all start living like it? Let's do that. Let's pray. Father, we long to do what is right and we long to live rightly. We long to live lives in light of the truth, in light of this momentous fact that Jesus has been raised, in light of the, the reality that that resurrection of your son vindicated everything he ever said proved that he is the son of God because he said he's the son of God and you would not have raised from the dead a liar. The resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead vindicates his choice of the apostles who were assigned by him and given authority by him to go out and preach the gospel. The vindication of Jesus Christ by being raised from the dead proves that when he sent the Holy Spirit to give your power to your church, to your people, even to give the scriptures of the New Testament to us through your apostles, that it's all true, that this is what's real. But Father, we are so confused in our flesh and in our sin, all the things we've heard, all the time that's passed. Lord, we're like people who forget that there's a cause and effect. Just because we can't see the effect and it's been so long, Lord, would you help us to know and to live like we know that because Jesus is alive, the day of the resurrection is coming, his kingdom is coming, our king is coming, and death will die. So, Lord, teach us how to live, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.